Hello, and welcome to the Consortium of Universities for Global Health webinar series. Today's webinar is a very special webinar on health and medical education challenges in the Middle East, looking at Syria as a case example. COVID-19, we know, has dominated the discourse around global health, but there are many, many important vital issues and challenges that continue to occur that cost lives, cost futures in many ways. One of those challenges that has been with us since 2011 is the tragic and horrible situation taking place in Syria. Since 2011, a quarter of a million people, mostly civilians, have lost their lives. It has been a land racked by violence where civilians have been born the brunt of this. Uh, healthcare workers have been deliberately targeted by Russian bombers, by the Syrian government. Torture and murder has taken place and gross human rights abuses have been meted out to the civilian population in Syria. In the midst of this, there have been heroic individuals who have persisted and continued to try to provide care and continue to train Syrians in being able to care for their people. It is my great honor today to have four of those individuals with us today who are going to share the situation in Syria and the future, and what can be done to, to provide peace and security for the people of Syria. Our first speaker will be Mr. Mustafa Kaeli. Mr. Kaeli is the head of international relations at the Academy of Health Sciences in Idlib, Syria. Then Dr. Abdullah Al-Haji is the president of the Academy of Health Sciences will speak, followed by Dr. Asiya Al-Ramun, who is the vice dean of nursing at the Academy of Health Sciences. Then finally, Dr. Mohamed Badawi is a researcher and clinician in psychiatric nursing and mental health based in Rehani, uh, Turkey, and then we'll get to questions and answers. So it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Mr. Kayeli. Uh, Mustafa, over to you. One day, H.G. Wells, the famous British writer said, if you don't end war, war will end us. And one more time, President John Kennedy, the American president said, mankind must put an end to war before war put us to end to mankind. We, Syrian people, we were first to be indulged in a war, to participate in a war, to be killed, tortured, displaced, to be dreamless hopeless, mindless, and to lose all of our wishes, and to leave our houses, and to be humiliated in all possible ways, and the world did nothing to them. Ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to Syria 2020, blood, death, destruction. As for the beginning, and as you all know, coming back to the area before 2011, health and medical education was very common in the Arab region, and in Syria in Bar in which a doctor is being seen as the highest level and highest trunk of social structure for jobs and for positions. That was because of all people here in Syria respect doctors for the great humanitarian role they have and they do for people. And here in Syria before war, as you can see, it was paradise. And then, and as you know, because of the state of stability of war uh, in Syria before 2011, Doctor's focus was dealing with cold cases. And I mean, whenever I say cold cases, it's because of there were no war in Syria before 1973. And uh, then, as you know, the genocide that happened in Hamas in 1982, where Al-Assad father made a massacre in, in Hamas city and killed nearly about 30 to 40,000 people. And here are pictures for what happened at, at, at that time. And unfortunately, we don't have enough materials related to this genocide at that time. As a result of, you know, of that stability, uh, uh, topics related to world medicine or biomedics or pre-hospital phase, call it whatever you, name you want, there were no focus at that. And having in mind the stability of education process at Syrian universities between 1983 and 2010, and you know, this period it was stable, all graduates of Syrian university were able to work at Gulf countries, just like anyone who was graduated from Alibaba University, Damascus University, or Shri University, they had, you know, the chance and dream to obtain a job. 
as traveling to Gulf countries. And uh, this was very common in the area between 2005 and 2010, before the war. And then it was 2011, the beginning of destruction for the Arab world. As you know, with signs of the beginning of uh, the Arab Spring, the late of 2010 and the beginning of 2011, there were radical changes and revolutions in the surrounding countries, like in Tunisia and Egypt. And dreams of Syrian people at the beginning, it wasn't about, you know, to fall down on Assad regime. No, they were just calling for some political freedoms, removing the security grid, allowing democratic practices, removing Article 8 of the Constitution related to a bad party, and canceling a state of emergency that was activated since 1960s. Because of for that, you know, state of emergency, anyone might be killed, might be arrested, might be humiliated for no reason, and nobody is going to help him. Very Syria, as you can see, unfortunately, it's all destroyed. And like practices that happened in surrounding countries like Egypt and Tunisia, those they had the revolution uh, successful, and for other countries they had reformation. Syrian people never ever believed that this Arab Spring is going to destroy their country and let the spring be like hell, as you see. We have many pictures of destruction of, of Syria during that time. And in 2012, I remember that a friend of me told me that there was a prophecy in the Bible that came true from Isaiah 17.1. Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a hub of thrones. And unfortunately, not only Damascus became a hub of thrones, most major cities in Syria were the same and they were destroyed. And, uh, you know, it's something sad. As you can see those pictures, Syria before and after war, how it was and how it became and how was the situation at that time and became now, right now. And after the beginning of uh, this revolution, you know, and after the destruction, we became thinking about detainees those people who were arrested by the regime. We were thinking about injured people, about displaced people, about those who were, you know, basically under, uh, you know, torture. And uh, millions of refugees, millions of Syrians, millions of civilians, they were running from death to countries, to Turkey, to Lebanon, to Jordan, and to European countries. And uh, because of what happened, and I think that all of you know, uh, during the last few months, you're hearing about this is a Syrian civilian protection that was signed by uh, President Trump. It was for an anonymous soldier who leaked 55,000 pictures for 11,000 people who were killed under torture. And this picture is for a friend of mine who was arrested in 2014 and he was killed under torture. And as you can see, uh, it's a real story. I mean, the story of our blood, of our suffering. Is something tragic, you know, it's something very sad because of those people, they had dreams, they had family, they had prospects. Each one of them had a family, had a crying mother waiting for him, had a wife, and those people are not members. They were human beings and they were for help, and unfortunately, we weren't able to help them. They passed away. And whenever I think about victims of war, then we have thousands of thinkers, thousands of talented people and academic personalities, such as Basil Cartabil. He, you know, he was one of the major people in the world who were thinking about the creative common. And he was arrested by the regime, and then he was killed without sending his corpse to his family. And we have Rosan Zaytuna, you know, she's an activated. She was kidnapped in 2015, and no information about her happened since that time. And we have
Uh, you know, uh, we had uh, this, you know, Rana, uh, the doctor Rana. She was, she's, yeah, yeah, she passed away because of, uh, you know, she was arrested. Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you now. Doctor, okay. And Dr. Rana, she was, uh, you know, a shaman of she's in Syria and she was arrested with her husband and six children. And no, we know nothing information about them. Unfortunately, it's something you know uh, very sad for Rana, Doctor Rana. And uh, whenever we we talk about tourism during the last few years, the regime was keep saying and keep talking about that people who are living in Idlib they are too. Unfortunately, and the regime were attacking and destroying tourism in Idlib. So the world would say it's okay, keep killing them. But for God's sake, for heaven, who is a tourist? Can you define this word? Can you define this expression? Who is a tourist? Okay. Is it just to kill a civilian and to pretend he, he is a Try turning off the webcam. We're just having a few difficulties with um, with uh, Mr. Kylie's um, internet connection right now. So let's move to uh, Dr. Alhaji, who is the president of the Academy of Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Alhaji, would you like to turn on your uh, camera, please? And you, you can start. And also your mic, too. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Al Haji. Hello. We can hear you perfectly well. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Al Haji, please. Dear all, many thanks for having this opportunity. I have, uh, I know that I am talking in this webinar while hundreds are joining us. I know that thousands might watch us later but in truth i'm sure 100 percent that millions of syrian people would wish to get such a chance to talk and express about their pain they would talk about how painful is to lose a close friend how painful is uh, it's uh, for a mother to lose her sole son how painful for a wife to lose her husband, how painful for a woman to answer questions of her son who is asking her about his father. And the same woman, she, she doesn't know where he is, whether he is alive. How painful for an old man to have his house destroyed and to be forced to live in a tent, a blue tent. A blue stupid tent. Blue is supposed to be the color of the sky, but is the color of our migration 
why is the color of our doom and sadness? Why is the color of our ambiguous future? We know that justice would prevail one day, sooner or later, in a way or another. In this life or in the other life, justice will reveal. I know and I am sure. Just like Billy Graham, the American evangelist, once said, I never saw a you hell behind a hearse. When it's the moment of death, you will never take with you your treasure and money. All, all you will take is your good deeds. And if you were hurting people in, in this life, moons of their tortured souls will lead you to the gate of the hell. Coming back to the Syrian war in 2012, area liberated from the regime control were bombed and targeted with bombs, airplanes, rockets, and heavy weapons. As a result, a severe educational and medical bodies and institutions were targeted, leading to their destruction, which lead to complete depends on field hospital education. Those field hospitals were taking places in homes and houses for the rabbit treatment of the injured. When it is about schools and universities areas, liberated from a regime faced organized targeting of the educational buildings over and over and over again. But we have a dreams. Dreams without goals are just dreams. Hard works, works. Now, perhaps one of the case of this targeting is the regime's bombing of the Haas schools countryside of Idlib on October 26, 20, uh, 2016, in which dozens of children and teachers were killed in the school. Many other cases of targeting educational and medical situation happened during the last few years. Headquarters of the academy was targeted many times, and many students and faculty members passed away during those attacks. You see with me here our building when targeting from the criminal airplane in Aldana in northeast uh, west uh, east of Syria, and here uh, uh, a student, a martyr student of our, uh, our academy, and we have two faculty members, Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Muhammad, were killed from targeting with a bomb from criminal aircraft. May their souls rest in peace. We return the idea of higher education. There has never been any educational institution concerned with higher education before 2012. After that date, many local universities started to appear such as Al-Shamal Private University, Idlib University, Ali Kufri University, Mari University, and Al-Shahba University. For me personally, I went back to Syria for two reasons. First, trying to provide medical assistance to those who are in need of emergency medicine, having in mind that paramedics program was not taught in Syria before the war. Second, an attempt to establish an educational body that could satisfy the severe shortage in the number of doctors who were forced to travel or killed or arrested. We started the idea of this academic institution by providing short duration courses not exceeding two weeks in first aid first responder emergency medical technician basic the main objective of these courses was to save the life of the victims actually mass casualties taking into account of mass casualties and the severe shortage of paramedics here the uh, last one buildings uh, in northern uh, East Syria, near Turkish border. This is the building of our academy. You uh, see it uh, between the 
blue sea. Blue sea mean uh, refugee camps. We see the blue color, but it's surrounding in, uh, with another color. It's the green. This is the uh, our hope green, inshallah. After we partially covered the gap in the field, after we trainee, uh, trained about 1,000 trainees to do first aid and deal with direct injuries, we believed that we should go ahead and improve our courses. We thought about developing, developing the teaching process to turn into a comprehensive educational methodology for institutions of higher education. In this regard, we moved from intensive short-term training course to the academic methodology that adopts international academy curriculum. We plan to satisfy the need of the field and the need for the labor market for our courses. There was a need to communicate, to communicate and deal with local rescue institutions such as the civil defense, the civil defense and white helmets. Therefore, the civil defense course was added to our courses. We taught the courses 50% in English in order to keep uh, pass with the scientific de development bodies, giving students an opportunity for future development. Our courses became one single coherent structure that supports the students the labor market and the community's need. Hence, the duration of the study was four years and due to the instability of political and military, military conditions in Syria, we reduced the course to be two years uh, while doing our best to keep quality of teaching and materials that are being taught not being affected by this reduction. In the beginning, our focus was restricted to paramedics. After that, and due to the great need, we developed our courses in a way that can simulate the chain of survival. As you know, we have the chain of survival consists of three cycles, pre-hospital, golden hour, I mean, hospitals, post-hospital. The pre-hospital stage is identical to the paramedics program, and its aim is to save the life of the injured in the first golden moment of the injury and preserve life such as possible. Hospitals, second phase, the, the hospital stage is identical to the nursing program and it, its goal is to support the or injury to arrive at the hospital and to provide all requirements in order to overcome the situation of danger. Post-hospital stage is the, the, uh, identical to the physical therapy program. The aim of this course is to rehabilitate and uh, the patient or the injured after leaving the hospital and to provide psychological and, and physical therapy and rehabilitation of the, after the injury in order to help this person to be a successful member of society. It's worth mentioning that this program is important taking into account that there are more than 1.9 million disabilities in Syria as a result of the war. This program can also provide specialized physical therapists for the post-war phase. The circumstances were very difficult, but we had a great uh, insistence on, cover, on, cover, on overcoming the difficulties, bridging the existing gap and providing everything possible that can help the society. Correct concepts of medical practice were our focus taking into account that the wrong practice that were applied were the indirect per, uh, reason for the death of a large number of injured people. In addition to the academic program that we teach 
we provided professional diplomas for nurses and doctors for the uh, purpose of providing the best means to preserve the, life, the, the lives of the injuries. Such as critical care transport, dealing with chemical weapons, basic life support, uh, ad advanced cardiac life support, uh, basic trauma life support courses, for the moment, we are focusing on COVID-19, as you see in this picture. Many of our graduates are currently working in a field hospital supported by NGOs in Idlib, in addition to hospitals located with the Turkish control areas in northern Syria. What distinguishes Academy of Health Sciences is that we are more open to the world because we work directly without any limits, restrictions, or bureaucracy that restrict work activity, communications, and correspondence. In addition to the network of partners we have and the accreditation of our programs from one of the European accreditation institutions, Aquin, we still will and plan to face all challenges and difficulties that we have, we fail to plan, not plan to fail. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Haji, and we're going to go to uh, Dr. Uh, El Ramun, uh, Dr. El Ramun, uh, uh, over to you, please. You turn on your mic and your camera, please. Thank you. Welcome. We can't hear you. When talk about learning and teaching in Syria, we fall work. Can you hear me? Yes, it's good now. When talk about learning and teaching in Syria, before we, we have to mention that learning is still traditional and characterized by teacher-centered approach. This traditional method-centered on the teacher who is controlling the course content and the method of presentation, i.e. focusing on teacher rather than student. <laughs> the modern style of medical education has not yet been introdu introduced. This method depends on a student-centered approach in which the students are encouraged to take great responsibility for learning decisions and to question what and how they learn while they are supervised by a mentor. Because we don't have any traditional methods, so our courses are following the modern style. War in Syria has left the country's higher education system fragments and broken. The focus on traditional teaching and hospital-oriented education has prevented the appropriate resp response to community needs. In June 18, 2019, the university has published a study called Syrian Higher Education System Facing Completely Broken After Eight Years of War. The conflict in Syria has left the country's higher education system fragment and fragment and broken, with universities suffering politicization, politicization and militarization and human rights violations, including disappearances and murder. According to researchers from the University of Cambridge on Syrian academics in exile, one of the professors was dragged away by two, by two security officers in front of the students that professor was taking to prison. 
and the chart because of his political views. The report's findings, findings were drawn from existing academic research and the great literature, literature such as news and NGO reports, together with 117 remote interviews with university staff and students still in Syria conducted by compatriot academics in exile. Focus, group decisions, discussions, and the personal testimonies for 19 Syrian academics living in exile in Turkey. In addition to that, Syrians' brain drain of faculty members has the most damaging effect on education. Until the end of 2012, education was a good state because most of the professors were still there. Yet, 2013 witnessed witness the beginning of mass immigration of university professors. Can you imagine the number in 2020? We know the numbers of professors is very low. For that reason, we are doing our best to help our students in order to be the best graduate. Official sources estimate that by 2015 are four years of war. After four years of war, Syrian have lost up to approximately one third of its professors. It's a large, large number. This loss of the human resources is compounded by academics being removed from their posts for political reasons. Many of best qualified professors left as they had the best jobs, best prospects abroad. Experienced professors were replaced by much less qualified ones. Secondly, serious war economy places major burdens on higher education. It's very difficult for a faculty member to teach and prepare researches while his financial conditions are not good enough. And I say it's zero. Attendance rates of students have fluctuated rapidly as environmental conditions pose severe obstacles to simply attending university. In particular, Male students stay at home to avoid forcible arrest at military checkpoints. With many such checkpoints across Syrian cities, travel times to campus have in many areas become very long. Thus, the students prefer to stop attending lectures, leading to negative, to negative effects on their understanding for courses they have already admitted to. Many universities and institutes are not being repaired due to high probability they may get targeted and damaged. How sad this would be. Medical faculties and institutes are struggling to modernize methodologies and to move towards an integrated model that can produce health-oriented professionals who are able to work for health promotion, disease prevention, and the cure. As with other service, service sectors that have gradually grown according to the interest and the priority in the, the growth of medical sector in the city has been natural, ranging from field medical centers to hospitals and health centers subject to coherent administrative organization and sections. <clears throat> this transition between emergency response and organized care is made according to the, to the needs of the region. In the period of funding and military targeting, the medical response is limited to fulfilling the damage caused by military actions on the ground for both wounded and injured people. However, when the region is in a state of, of 
uh, stability, the organizations and, and, and institutions concerned are able to move forward to expand health services. We are waiting for this stability in order to achieve this traditional state. We hope. Moving towards improving medical performance in general, both at the level of the type of medical services, their numbers, centers, and facilities. This improvement is associated with the decline of military operations in the region to, the, to, to a large extent. However, the medical sector is still facing other challenges. The challenges are too many, and due to absence of time, I would like to talk about a few of them. The medical education in Syria faces multiple ch challenges that are <coughs> represented by many factors, including, but not limited to, all curriculum, traditional teaching methods, and unavailability of proper facil facilities. Colleges are concentrating more on students, students' attendance, and less on updating the curriculum, which is sometimes outdated. The situation of medical education in Syria is complex and determined by many factors, including, including politics, financial matters, planning, and security situation. At present, the strategic plan to shape the future of medical education in Syria is vague due to unstable military and political situation, camps spreading and enlarging numbers of refugees, and also their unknown future of all people in Syria. Um, I mean, especially children and teenagers. That's the, the, the most serious uh, people who are affected uh, of the work. These challenging settings combined with the imagination, immigration of skilled doctor, doctors have led to pressure on junior staff to act beyond their cap capabilities and significant uh, psychological strain. For instance, medical students, nurses, or pharmacists are forced to work as trauma surgeons or Technicians to take so to take to take so responsibility for anesthetizing people, the patients. The high level of trauma witness, together with the inadequate resources to hand and the ability, the inability to provide for their families, have resulted in secondary trauma to, to help the staff working inside Syria. Thank you for listening. Dr. Martin, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, uh, we're turning over to Dr. Badawi. Thank you very much, Dr. Al Ramun. Dr. Al Ramun, uh, we're turning it over now to Dr. Badawi. And uh, Dr. Badawi, if you could turn on your mic and turn on your camera, please. Thank you. I think, uh, Dr. Badawi, could you turn on your uh, camera and your mic, please? I'm just waiting for Dr. Badawi, who is in Turkey right now. You could turn on your uh, turn on your mic and your camera, please. I think we've got your screen up. So you're on for a second. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Badawi. Please go ahead, Dr. Badawi. You are you are on. Please turn on your mic. Thank you. Uh, 
لكن مباشر ما بتطلع الصورة ما تتشارك بس تعال طلع الصورة يا أخي أنا ما ما بتطلع الصورة أنا بس دقيقة بتطلع الصورة دكتور داو، we can hear you. Uh, please go ahead and uh, start your yeah, presentation. Thank you very much. Numerous studies around the world have shown that armed conflict affects the civilian population and cause disparate long-term psychological and mental illness which make adaptation of youth and the children in the future a difficult process and make peace and security more difficult. The results of these studies apply to the Syrian reality. In the north of Syria because we have been suffering for nine years from bomb placement, torture, injustice, detention, and many others. The university students who lead and participated in the Syrian revolution since its inception on 15 March 2011 are now young people participating in resisting the criminal regime, where they presented hundreds of martyrs, injured, and detainees in defense of our right to live in freedom and dignity. We they were also subjected to injustice, persecution, arrest, abuse, and other repressive methods which left them with various negative psychological effects. As a result of the traumatic events and the money crisis and stressors that university students were exposed to, especially that their childhood stage was during the war. They suffer from behavioral problems such as aggressive and impulsive behavior, the inability to blame for the future, recklessness, neglecting personal safety and safety of others, predication and aggression in terms of repeated physical quarrels. In addition to personal problems such as feeling deficient, introverted behavior, difficulty making daily decisions, physical problems such as headache, joint pain, sleep difficulties, lack of appetite, and academic problems such as school delay, lack of educational achievement, poor attention and concentration, and amnesia. They also have many negative feelings, such as feelings of anger, anxiety, blame, shame, sadness, guilt, despair, impotence, and worthlessness. University students have been exposed to many social and environmental factors that cause mental illness, including traumatic events in childhood, such as the death of a parent 11 years ago, divorce of parents and dependency education, disposition of traumatic life events, such as the death of loved one, separation from the lover and exposure to more than stressors at the same time, and the length of time being exposed to the stressors, loss and the ensuing process of grief.
the absence of social and emotional support when exposed to stress and a traumatic event such as watching the incident of killing another person, torture, and exposure to an accident threatening the life of the person and his family. In addition to poverty and displacement. Not forgetting physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, child labor, early marriage, and school dropout. As a result of the social and environmental factors that cause psychiatric diseases that university students have been exposed to, the prevalence of mental illness has increased, especially major, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, uh, or dysthymic disorder, bipolar disorder, cyclothymic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder or uh, PTSD, illness and anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, acrophobia, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, and other psychotic disorders, substance-related disorders, especially abuse or dependence on amphetamines, nicotine, opiates, cannabis, inhalants, and anti-anxiety. Also dissociative amnesia, personality disorders, especially antisocial personality disorder. In young children, bedwetting and attention deficit hyperactivity and post-traumatic stress disorder increased. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Badawi, and we'll bring all of our speakers back on. I'm just going to, uh, uh, Mr. Kiley was unfortunately had lost his connection, and I think uh, when Mr. Kiley uh, gets on, he'd like to take a minute or so just to finish some comments regarding his uh, presentation. Um, Mr. Kiley, if you're on, please over to you, and then we'll get to some questions and answers from everybody. Mustafa, if you're on, please turn on your camera, as everybody should turn on their camera uh, right now. Thank you. As we're waiting for uh, Mr. Kylie, it was uh, really inspiring and, and heart-wrenching to hear uh, the situation in Syria. And the thrust of the questions I'm going to ask are really what's next. Uh, uh, Mr. Kylie is on. So, uh, Mr. Kylie, would you like to make a few final uh, comments regarding uh, your presentation. Please, over to you, Mustafa. Hello. Please, Mustafa, you're on. It's okay? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay, uh, many thanks for giving me the opportunity. Actually, we had a problem related to internet connection. So, uh, I just was talking about the problem of terrorism that the media was, during the last few years, always saying and talking about terrorism that the regime and his allies are killing those civilians in Idlib and pretending that they are terrorists. So there should be a specific defension for someone who is a terrorist because it's unfair to kill someone and then pretend that because he's a terrorist to kill him. Okay, this is a very bad problem. The humanitarian action regarding that. You can't kill anyone and then say, I kill him because he's a terrorist, and then they will say, yeah, it's okay. If he's a terrorist, then you can kill him. There is, you know, an ethical dilemma about this problem. And, uh, you know, uh, that that was a problem, and uh, then we had a problem with uh, refugees, those who went to, to, to Lebanon, to Jordan, to Turkey, and then traveled to, to uh, Europe, and uh, those people nowadays, they have the, the problem of belongingness, where they are and what country they belong to. And uh, after that, we had the opposite direction of, uh, you know, uh, of coming back. We have Basar Shahada, who is a Christian man who was in USA and came back to Syria and he was killed by the regime. So there is nothing called Syrian war in Syria. It's a war between uh, the regime, his allies on one part, and the people in Syria uh, as second part. 
that's my you know uh, addition that i wanted to you know to add and many thanks for giving me the opportunity and uh, the one more time i'm sorry for that connection thank you so much thank you thank you very much mr kelly you know it's uh, perfectly understandable uh, the challenges you would have with internet connections but thank you for completing it so i'm going to start with a, a question uh, to dr al haji and then to uh, dr al ramun dr al haji the 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 core of the situation right now you have a, a really tenuous ceasefire where you are in Idlib, but all of you described the, the, the traumatic uh, uh, the devastation inflicted upon the civilian population. Dr. Al-Haji, what is necessary now to be able to have long-term peace and stability within Syria? What are the next steps that need to be taken to stop the, uh, the killing of civilians and the human rights abuses? Uh, what should be done to stop war yes. and to hurt people? What should we do to get to the peace and stability? That is correct, Dr. Yes. Al-Hajj. Thank you for this question. I think uh, next uh, to get the peace. Um, I don't know. Uh, I believe any society uh, will develop with uh, uh, education, lectures. Um, we want to uh, give uh, attention to the education for a new generation, a new, a new blood in, in, in our country. For for the world, for the world and government, the, uh, I I don't know for uh, for example the political uh, affairs. I I I I, I am not a political man. Um, I uh, understand in uh, educational universities, new generation in our uh, country. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Haji. Uh, uh, Dr. Al Ramun, uh, you eloquently described the, the challenges of, of educating and providing care uh, under the current conditions that you're in. Now, 30,000 people will have a chance to see this webinar. What message would you like to give to the international community in terms of the needs of the academy and the needs of being able to train and retain? healthcare workers and teachers and others uh, in Syria right now? Mm. I, I think uh, we need to hear you. I, I could yes. hear the question yes. so, so well. Please, yeah. can you? Yeah. Would you like me to repeat the question, Dr. al -Ramun? Ah, yes. Sorry, yes. I, I can't hear. Oh, that's yes, perfectly please. fine. I couldn't hear. Internet. Not a problem. I'll repeat the question, okay. uh, Dr. Alperman. So the question is, you, you powerfully describe the challenges of teaching right now at the academy. Can you describe to yes. us the message that you'd like to give to the international community? How can they be of assistance to you and your colleagues in being able to get the curricula and the trainers and other infrastructure to be able to train the healthcare workers and other of uh, individuals uh, at the academy? How can international communities support the work you and your colleagues are trying to do to train healthcare workers in Idlib? I speak in Arabic and Mr. Kayali speak in English. Please. Can I translate my, my speech? Yes, Mr. Mr. Kayali, Kayali will translate. Okay, you can uh, Arabic, okay. It's easier. Please. Uh, 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 Okay, as for Academy of Health Sciences, we are having and choosing the best qualified faculty members 
and we are trying to improve our students and help them to get the best uh, possibilities and ability, availability. هلا ثاني شيء بالنسبة للاعتماد العالمي عم نحاول إنه نحصل على الاعتماد من قبل الجهات الرسمية دائما مشان نحن نكون دائما بإعطائنا بمنهجيتنا يعني بإعطائنا للمناهج نكون منهجين أكاديميين عم نتبع أحسن المناهج العالمية. As for our courses, we seek to get accreditation for our programs in order to keep the high quality of the courses. That would help students. كمان بالنسبة للمناطق الآمنة عم نحاول نختار أكثر منطقة آمنة حتى نعمل فيها هلا أكاديميتنا بالنسبة لسوريا يعني تعتبر يعني منطقة آمنة نسبيا بحيث بيقدروا الطلاب يجوا يحضروا المناهج يحضروا الحاضرات وما يضيع عليهم أي فرصة بالحضور. As for having a safe zone, as you know, because of four, uh, there are not so many, so we had Academy of Health Sciences located in the best uh, uh, area near the Turkish borders in order to save and secure those students. That's all. Uh, thank you for, uh, for listening. Shukran, uh, Dr. Alfaroun. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Badawi, you powerfully described the mental health the consequences of witnessing and, and uh, the conflict and the trauma uh, that individuals and civilians are witnessing and the trauma, the mental health trauma inflicted upon uh, civilians. Can you share with us uh, a message to the world about how the international community can help uh, the academy and others to be able to provide the mental health care that uh, that uh, children and adults need right now. Over to you, Dr. Bedawi. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, you shared a lot of information about the situation here, for the mental health issues and the mental health issues. So what is the message that can reach the world through the mental health issues? From the beginning, we'll talk about it. Dr. Muhammad, Uh, we have in, uh, many services uh, to uh, illness patient. Uh, we have one uh, psychiatric patient uh, with uh, 21 uh, inpatient. Uh, we have in, uh, specialized person uh, work in this uh, programs uh, uh, to uh, uh, participate uh, to. Uh, assistance uh, illness patient. Uh, in Syria, many uh, of people uh, suffer from uh, uh, symptoms uh, of uh, depression. Uh, many stressors. 10 years, we uh, suffering from bombing, from uh, displacement. <laughs> Everything, everything. We need to stop the uh, regime. Bashar al-Assad killed the person. Uh, Syrian population uh, in South Northern uh, Syria have money, money, money crises and uh, stressors. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Badawi. So we're going to have the final question to Mr. Kayali, and then everybody will have a chance for final uh, comments and, and thoughts, and we'll go in the reverse order in which we started. Um, Mr. Kayali, there's a very graphic picture uh, of showing the academy and showing the refugee camp, uh, the, the thousands and thousands of Syrians that are squeezed into really uh, difficult conditions. Can you describe for the international community, what are the conditions that people are faced with in the refugee camps? What are some of the major health challenges that they're faced with? Um, and what is needed right now to address those? Please, over to you. Well, okay, thank you so much. Actually, you know, as regarding the difficulties they have, there are so many. And whenever you think about uh, those people who are living in the camps, uh, you are talking about a generation without an identity. I mean, whenever you have a boy or a girl who are 10 or 20 years old, they don't 
know why they are living in tents, in camps. Why? The reason they are there. They don't know their enemy. They don't know the reason. Why they don't have a house. Why they are not having good education. Why they don't have good uh, life. Whenever they watch TV or YouTube, they don't have a future. Whenever they think about future, they don't know what's future because it's extremely ambiguous. They don't have an identity, as I've said. For that reason, whenever I talk about a boy who is 12 years old, he's wasting his time, killing his time by maybe watching YouTube, and then the future, he might be a criminal. So we should do something for those people. We should help them. We should provide them with reason to live, to have a good life, to have you know a good standards of life, because they are like all people over the world. They are human beings, they are not numbers. All of those people, all of those who are living in camps, they should have a good life. And their families have houses. Those kids who lost their family because of war, they had a family and they should have a right to live a good life. For that reason, whenever I address the international world, then I would say that please do something for them. Please provide them with a good life with a life by the word of the, the meaning of the word because what they're having nowadays is is not a life they are just killing their time thank you very much uh, mr kiley those are um, important words very important uh, message to the international community so we're gonna everybody will have a chance now please to have a uh, a minute for your final thoughts and we're going to start with uh, dr badawi then to dr uh, el ramun dr al haji and then finally mr kiley um, Dr. Badawi, final thoughts, please, from you. Dr. Badawi, please, uh, final thoughts, uh, Dr. Badawi. If you have a fi any final comments that you'd like to make. Dr. Badawi, please, any final comments that you'd like to uh, uh, we need uh, end, we need we need the end of the war uh, because uh, my children, my adolescents uh, suffering from crises, uh, stressors um, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Badawi. Uh, uh, Dr. El Ramun, please over to you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the children. The children is uh, the the base, the base of uh, of the world, the base of life. Uh, if we are life is uh, has gone, uh, I sh it sh we should, uh, as uh, Dr. Dadawi said, to end the war, uh, to make to to make a chance to the children to. Uh, to live uh, a new and safer future. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Um Dr. Al Haji, please over to you. I would like uh, to thank you, all people standing with us, standing with the um, uh, people who uh, are in need, uh, standing with weak people actually in northern uh, east of Syria. And we uh, try and try, we, uh, as I told, we uh, not uh, uh, plan to fail, we fail to, 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 to plan. Uh, thank you for uh, the consortium uh, of global health universities for this uh, chance to uh, talking about, about uh, our uh, educational situation in Syria. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Haji. Uh, you have a difficult job, uh, all of you. Um, uh, Mr. Kiley, your final comments, please. Okay, actually, what I would like to say and talk about is for those who are still under torture, who are still arrested, I would like to say the rest. That's my, my message that between 2011 and 2013, we had Caesar Lakes. And up till now, people are being tortured. Up till now, people are being killed under torture. Up till now, we have families who are waiting for their, uh, you know, children, waiting for the wives.
and they still have hope. So if there is a possibility in any way, any possible way, any expected way, to try to, to Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Kiley. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I think uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank all of you and your colleagues for what you're trying to do under exceptionally difficult circumstances. Our aspiration is that despite the COVID-19 pandemic that is raging around the world, that we do not take our eye off the conditions in Syria, the human rights abuses in Syria that you've all eloquently described, the fact that there is a tenuous ceasefire, but as all of you have described, the only path forward is for peace, peace, stability, and security for the people of Syria. And that is clearly something that all of us around the world need to continue to pressure our political leaders to pursue uh, with the international community to stop the human rights abuses, stop the, the targeted bombing and killing of uh, healthcare workers' facilities and educational facilities is an egregious human rights, rights abuse. Um, I would draw your attention to a film called The New Barbarianism that was made by our colleagues next door to us here in Washington at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which described uh, in, in heart-wrenching detail the type of situation that all of our speakers uh, described today. I would encourage you to look at it. It is online. Um, and I'd encourage all of, all of our international community to engage with the Academy of Health Sciences, to work with the colleagues there, uh, in a respectful way to see how we can work with them to end the conflict and to ensure that uh, we can do whatever we can to support your great work. So I'd like to, to thank once again, uh, Dr. Uh, Al-Haji, Dr. Uh, Al-Ramun, uh, Dr. Badawi, and Mr. Kayali. I'd like to thank Janice Smith also for her great uh, production skills in putting this uh, webinar on, which will be seen and can be viewed on our website at cugh.org sometime in the next week, and we encourage you to share it widely. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening today. Uh, Salam alaikum, and uh, we hope you have a, a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank, thank you. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.